Hi, and welcome back to The Secret Life of Parkinson's. I'm Jessica Krauser, and unfortunately, I am not here with Brian Baker yet again. Uh, Brian is actually at the Cleveland Clinic this week getting some uh, clinical trials done for his DBS. So interestingly enough, we already had scheduled for our podcast uh, to talk to somebody from the Cleveland Clinic who is a clinical research coordinator. So I'd like to welcome Jennifer, Jennifer Molay. Jennifer, Hello. welcome. And did I get your last name right? You got it perfectly. Right. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. So, um, so yeah, I thought it was, Brian was originally supposed to be here, but I, you know, I don't think he had his priorities straight in terms of what he was supposed to do first. But um, so he signed up for, or I think he was asked to do a clinical trial. Um, he didn't know exactly what it was for, but it was because he's had DBS done. Um, so is that like, there's got to be a ton of studies going on. Is that right? There are quite a few studies for Parkinson's and DBS. Yeah. Um, it, they could be very long and detailed, or they could be quick questionnaire mm -hmm. studies. Um, so I hope that he has a good visit and um, comes back and has good things to report about his experience at yeah. the Cleveland Clinic. Great. Yeah. So Brian, when you're watching this, come back home safe, safely and soon. Um, but today we're actually going to talk to Jennifer um, about the PPMI study, which we have brought up before. And just quickly to say it again, um, not that I have in episodes before, PPMI is a Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. Um, and it's, uh, is it called led by or originated by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, correct? Uh Right. Or run by run. Yeah. Run by. Yeah. But so um, so they are working with um, the Cleveland Clinic, which is where you are, the one in Cleveland. Um, so we wanted to learn more about that because I think it's really important when I learned about this study last year, that it's not something that just Parkinson's patients can do, but it's also everybody else can do it because of the PPMI study, it's it's hopefully going to figure out what those biomarkers are. So I wanted you to kind of at least start out with like, what is PPMI going to do? What is a biomarker? What does that mean for um, Parkinson's disease in general? Okay, sure. Great. Well, PPMI started in 2010. Um, and the sponsor of the study is the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And their goal is to find a biomarker, which is um, like a biological characteristic in your body. If you um, say like diabetes has a biomarker for glucose level or mm -hmm. your A1C, um, heart disease, um, an abnormal EKG, or perhaps um, high cholesterol levels. Those could be indicators for heart disease. Mm -hmm. But Parkinson's doesn't have anything like that. There's no magic... Uh, um, answer to what is causing it, how, why do people get it, um, how are you going to progress. So the Fox Foundation put together this really groundbreaking study um, 12 years ago, and it's still chugging away today. They started off just looking for um, early Parkinson's, so people who diagnosed with their PD for less than two years, and they uh -huh. didn't, hadn't started medication. Okay. And they were also looking at some um, age and sex match sex matched healthy controls so okay. folks that didn't have pd or any kind of neurological disease just healthies and they were going to compare their findings on those two groups and um, collect all kinds of data so it's interesting um I, so i'm in the pharmaceutical industry i work for a consulting company um, that works with pharma companies who are launching their first drug and i know we're not talking about a drug but we talk about clinical trials all the time and i know all the different you know phases and how long things take but when you said 12 years i was like wow really like okay well it was supposed to be for five years oh. <laughs> but it was generating such a marvelous wealth of information oh. um it, because it's a global it's a global study it's yeah. across 50 um sites and it's in, all across the united states from massachusetts to california it's in the uk it's in many sites in europe it's in um, Lagos, Nigeria. There's a site in Tel Aviv, so it's really global. And um, there, all these patients have Parkinson's. All of the data is collected in the same way. All the biological specimens mm -hmm. are collected in the same way. So it's a very pure data set, and it's free. It's yeah. for researchers that are um, interested in doing uh, Parkinson's research, and the Fox Foundation makes it available to researchers for free. You just um, you apply, say, I, I would like to have these samples. Here's my project, and there they go. They're off and running, 
and there's been millions of downloads of the data and um, and clinical trials are now shaping their clinical trials based on PPMI data. So they already Amazing. are using PPMI data. Oh, they're using it. Oh, yes. that's great. Okay, I didn't know that. So uh, real quick, let's back up and talk about the PPMI study. So the one that like I took it and it was an online, you know, questionnaire, you just ask questions and you keep getting um, going to the next one. But is there something that you have that people come to and they do it live? Right. So PPMI is really branched out. When it first started, it was a clinical trial where people would come to their particular site, their mm -hmm. hospital or academic center for their visits. They'd have a screening visit, make sure mm -hmm. they meet the eligibility criteria to be in the study. And then um, if they were eligible to be in the study, they would come in for a visit a couple of months later. We would collect um, biological specimens like blood, urine, spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. um, we would do brain imaging with an wow. MRI and some special uh, nuclear medicine imaging called a DAT spec scan. Yeah, I had that done. Uh, okay, measures the area mm -hmm. in your brain that makes your dopamine. Yep. And Parkinson's patients will show a, um, a diminished area. It shrinks yep. a little bit and where in a healthy control it should be. Um, you know, not shrinking. And then all kinds of questionnaires about mood and their activities of daily living mm -hmm. um, and a cognitive battery, about 40 minutes worth of, um, I'm going to give you a list of words and then you yeah. tell me as many as you can remember, draw this shape, repeat after me, all kinds. It's a long day. It can, it can go over multiple days. And so the patients are going to come and do that. And then they come periodically, uh -huh. um, maybe every six months and once a year to repeat all of those same assessments hmm. again. And all of that data is uploaded into databases wow. and over the years. And like I said, it was supposed to be for six, five years to start. And they just um, kept saying, let's keep extending it and collecting info. And you're still so, doing it that way? Yes, yes. I in the when wow. it first started en enrolling, we started in 2011 at Cleveland Clinic, and I've got about 22 or 23 patients that started then. So they're in year 10, 11, 12, 13 mm -hmm. of the study. Um, and they gotta love that. It, it's amazing. They they all they keep on coming. They I mean, I would. Coming. I know. I I did. I did one of those cognitive. Um, uh, tests kind of like what you were saying with the um, the questions uh, or like draw this do you remember this so I did one of those because I just I'm like I had to know for myself like what I was struggling like I knew what I was struggling with but I needed those around me to know that it's okay that that's where things are headed but I'm like I would love to do that every year every other year just for myself to understand you know because sometimes we drive ourselves crazy with like are we feeling this way? Is this real? Is this just normal life? Is this because of Parkinson's? So I'm yeah, sure a lot they... of the patients like to say, Jen, Jen, can you look back? How did I do last year? Yeah. Compared yeah. to what I did today. Yeah. So yeah, it's just a naturally curious, intuitive, you want to know how you're doing. Yeah. But that's not the only way that people can take the study, right? Like, cause like I said, right. I did one online. So how, how many, like, what is that? How long has that been going on? And how long are you guys going to keep it going on? Um, I call PPMI the study that will never die because it just keeps on going. So I, I can't say when it's going yeah. to be over, but they did launch an, an online initiative called PPM Online. Mm -hmm. And you can go to the Michael J. Fox website and, and search that if you want to join. And they are, they take a lot, thousands, many thousands of people are able to join that study and it's, they're collecting things like questionnaires and, um, and they do it at periodic intervals, maybe every three months you mm -hmm. would get um, a set of questionnaires and you're yeah. uploading. So um, a great way to follow Parkinson's patients and healthy controls and family members of patients with Parkinson's. So um, who's eligible? Healthy healthy men right now from um, age 30 to 80 mm -hmm. and um, Parkinson's patients um, and the early Parkinson's patients, um, folks that maybe have um, a risk factor for Parkinson's, mm -hmm. which means uh, maybe you've lost your sense of smell and you're over mm -hmm. the age of 60, could be a little bit of a risk factor. Um, maybe you have a REM behavior sleep disorder mm -hmm. called RBD. This is when you're acting out your dreams yeah. in your sleep. 
folks with a round behavior sleep disorder have an elevated risk of um, a neurological degenerative disorder in now, Parkinson's. So, did you guys learn that, like that? Did you guys learn that because of this study? Yes. Yeah, we did. That was uh, one of the things that that they added. Wow. Um, maybe several years into the study, they saw this trend. So they're like, well, let's look at folks that are prodromal. That mm -hmm. means they don't have a disease, but they have a risk factor mm -hmm. to go on to develop the disease. They're not it's not certain that they're going to. But, yeah. So they have a risk factor. So let's try and capture them too to follow them and see if they get Parkinson's while we're collecting all the same data across the board. Yeah. So um, and then folks can help out with online questionnaires too, and um, and then people also with certain genetic variants mm -hmm. are also eligible to be in PPMI. That's really interesting. That like you know you talk about the risk factors and. Um, you know, initially my mind was going across of like, would I, would I want to know? But if you have the gene, you don't know until you get that tested. So that's, that's one thing. But if you're acting out your dreams and you find out that you could have a higher likelihood to develop Parkinson's, you know, at first it's like, okay, is that, how does that weigh on somebody? But then again, so does all the different, um, risk factors that people might have for heart disease or for diabetes. And so then they're taught or, or you learn what to do to hopefully mitigate that disease. Right. Whereas with, so one of the, go ahead. One of the findings in PPMI for you're talking about mitigation, mm -hmm. exercise. We've found out that folks who exercise Yay! are slowing, maybe slowing the progression, their symptoms um, you know, kind of quiet down a little bit after they exercise. Mm -hmm. Maybe their thinking is a little more clear mm -hmm. after they exercise. So um, get on that bike and ride or jog or on your elliptical, whatever you can do to get your heart rate up. Yeah. It's great, great medicine for the body. And, and I think that's heart. that's a key point too. It's It's not just getting steps in. It's getting your heart rate up, which makes yep. the difference. Um, and so that, that we've talked about it plenty on this podcast of how important exercise is and and your heart rate and, you know, strengthening your muscles overall. But well, what else has come from PPMI um, so far? I was just reading that uh, a team in Pittsburgh, they found um, impulse control disorders are mm -hmm. can be common in Parkinson's, in particular with certain medications that treat PD. Yeah. So they um, um, paired up with 23andMe and they found some links. So maybe they can guide Parkinson's patients away from certain medications that can trigger these impulse control disorders like gambling or overeating, things like that, yeah. and get a treatment that's not as risky for that's them. That's great. That's actually, effects. that's really great. And for those, for people who don't have Parkinson's or who haven't dealt with those medications, I have a, a group of, of women that were all young onset and uh, across the United States, we just all found each other in you know different ways from social media. But um, there's 16 of us, and uh, like there's I think one one of the women said she didn't have that impulse control issue on the the drug, but the rest of us all did. And some of us oh. were like it, you know it worked for a while, but then it you know, keep increasing the medication and it just it, it, you don't hit that side effect until later, um, but that would have been fantastic to know if you know what they studied or what they learned that okay my body might not do well with that type of drug so just eliminate it all together because it was a really bad experience and i mean people that go on that drug sometimes they they gamble away you know life I had savings. a patient who gambled away an entire savings account yeah and people think, they could identify what it was oh and it's 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 crazy and you think you can control it and you want to control it, but it's it's a you know it's a medication in, in your in your. Yeah, drink. it's a physiological process. It's not willpower. Um, what else? I, I have has anything come out of getting a true, like, is there going to be a true biomarker? I guess when I was originally thinking of this, it, I was thinking there's going to be like one thing that would say. Oh, uh, the million dollar question. This test, no, you got it. I know. No, I, I don't believe there's going to be one biomarker, but you know, I don't know the future. It. What we have learned is that Parkinson's a very heterogeneous disease. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look the same in, in each person, yeah. even in the same person on a different day. Oh, Parkinson's trust me. Yep. look totally different. Yeah. So it's real. It's um, so hard to try and, um, you know, figure out a global 
uh, solution or target for a moving target, this disease that looks so different across the board. Mm -hmm. Some people have a tremor. Some people have the frozen gait. You know, some people don't even look like they have yeah. Parkinson's disease, but they're just moving a little slower. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're going to have, we're going to get the answer in small steps. Yeah. We're going to find something that works for a certain subgroup of Parkinson's patients. Like maybe the folks that have a tremor and don't have a lot of freezing of gait, we're going to find out, you know, a good treatment for that or find out something for folks that do have the freezing of gait, but maybe it won't work for the folks that are tremor predominant. So yeah. I think it's going to be like that, but you know, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm not um, a medical doctor. I'm just a little biologist here that's has a passion for, for sniffing out answers and beating it. my head against the wall from yeah. all the failing of <laughs> the clinical trials, but we're going to get there. Yeah. We you are guys are doing so much. This is, I do have yeah. one more question before we close out. Um, because somebody actually asked this, we get a lot of questions through the podcast, like in our comments, and I thought maybe this, the PPMI study would be able to answer or put something towards this. So you were mentioning um, somebody has a tremor and, and this, maybe we can treat them this way or if they have, you know, start bucketing people. Do you think, or is there hope that we will get to a day where, um, you know, right now everybody just, you just fall in the bucket of Parkinson's disease. Um, similar, not similar, but at some point way back when there was probably, it was just cancer, you know, but now there's breast cancer, there's colon cancer, the pink, you know, like all the different kinds. Do you think we will get to, or is that what people are striving for to get a type of Parkinson? So it's better treated. I don't know if we're striving for a type, but I think that that's what the data is starting to reveal Okay, that maybe it's not just this one Mm -hmm. big umbrella disease, yeah. but it, it's, yeah, in buckets or in subgroups. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it comes to in the future. Interesting. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you again well, so, so much. So much to find out. Yeah. I would love to have you on again if you'd like, you know, sometime this year, because it's just great to know, you know, the things that you guys are finding out or, if, you know, once things are published or posted, like you said, that in Pittsburgh, what they're doing, if if you want to send any of those along once they're public knowledge, I'd, I'd love to. I like reading that stuff. Oh, oh sure. My pleasure. Thank you so much that for having me. Well, in our last 30 seconds, I'll leave you all with this. If you've learned anything from this podcast episode, please go online and sign up for the PPMI study. It's something you could do as a questionnaire, whether you have Parkinson's or not, and continue to give data so that these researchers can do what they do best and hopefully find a cure one day for Parkinson's. So Jennifer, thank you again so much, and we'll see you guys all next time.